Welcome everybody, everybody online and everybody in here. So glad to see you. some faces we haven't seen in a while in here. Don't know about the faces out there. We're gonna start off with our field trip schedule. Uh, Hidden Springs Plant Survey, March 25th at 10 o'clock in the morning. Bill Hardberg, Hardberger Park in San Antonio, April the 29th. Another Hidden Springs Plant Survey in August. San Antonio Botanical Garden, September 30th. And then another Hidden Springs Survey in October. If you have an idea of a place you would like to go, tell somebody, preferably somebody on the committee or me or whatever. And we'll, Erin uh, will, you know, she'll take your request. I want to thank the volunteers who helped with the Georgetown Conservation Summit uh, February 25th in this room. We had about 136 people. We passed out blue bonnets and talked to people about drought tolerant plants. And we handed out our new handout that Randy has gotten posted online of our recommended uh, super drought tolerant native plants. And then I did a program with pictures of those beautiful drought tolerant native plants. And it was very good. Oh, it's the fan in the audience. So. <laughs> Um, then we, tonight, we have a crew over at Fern Bluff Elementary in Round Rock, their steam night, passing out uh, Mealy Blue Sages. So I want to thank, I had a nice crew show up both times to help put the plant plugs in bags and um, picked up and hauled stuff. That was really important. And I've just gotten a text with pictures that they're having a, a good time over there at Fern Bluff. This is it, y'all. It's that time of the year spring plant sale. The online sale is a big plants and I've explained that to y'all, you know, we don't want to haul all these three and five gallon plants down there and then maybe they sell and we have to haul them back. So you get a much bigger, better selection online. The availability list is live on the blog. You can't buy yet, can't buy until March 18th, but you can start plotting and, you know, counting your pennies and getting ready to purchase. Then we have our live sale April 1st at the Champion Park Pecan Pavilions. That's north and south Pecan Pavilions. They're right next to each other there on Brushy Creek Road. And I have the live, I have the availability list done for the live plant sale. And I will tell you that it is six solid pages of aerial narrow size 10 font okay there's a lot of choices on there <laughs> if you can't find something at this one mm, go to the uh, plant rescue maybe we we've got just a little bit of everything it's a really nice facility uh we'll be spread out and uh lots of shade and so looking forward to it if you would like to volunteer to help with preparation beforehand or after or for the day of the sale for setup, go to our uh, website under what we do in the plant sale page and there's a contact there and uh, our um, volunteer coordinator, Nancy Pumphrey will get your name and get you lined up to help somewhere, somehow. Upcoming programs, we've got a great set that uh, Susie Hickman has been working on. Next month, I will not be here, but uh, Cindy Crystal will be running things and the uh, program will be on cactus, um, Brian Laughlin. And then we've got some other good ones to follow that. If you've got a program idea, let us know. Tonight is our annual membership milestone night. And we have these people and I don't know. Christy Gardner, you're here. Come and get your 10 year pen, my dear. Congratulations. And I, some of these people I don't know, most of these people I do. So, if anybody else's name on the screen? No, it's in here. Okay. Congratulations. <laughs> I got to know Christy my very first plant sale. And then I found out she lives close to me. She has this awesome native yard. And then we have a whole bunch of us newbies that have finally reached our five-year pen. So besides me and my husband, we have Chris and Richard Doring, 
Penny Villanueva is over at um, Farm Bluff Elementary working tonight. And so I don't think there's anybody else in here. Is that right? I'm missing anybody? No? Okay. Hang in there, folks, and you'll start getting pretty pins too. Um, tomorrow, uh, tonight, we have free plants for those of your you are here in uh, those of you here in person hill country rain lily uh some nice little plants back there in those cardboard boxes take two or three because we've got a bunch we'll have some more for the sale i love this as a lawn weed you can plant it out in your lawn and according to barbara wright if you plant it or is that eh, maybe if you plant it deeper you get more flowers if you plant it shallower you get more bulbs so you can take one of each and do a deep one and do a shallow one. And, and it doesn't mind being mowed. Very drought tolerant. Pops up in flowers for you when it rains. Tonight, two of you will get uh, Texas Invasive Animals, a pocket folding guide to familiar animals that our speaker edited. Look at that nasty hog on there. <laughs> see this is us and where we are and where you find us and this is a reminder that always look for the location of the meeting especially now that summer is coming up because we we kind of have a reservation here at the library all summer long but sometimes we get bumped because of camp or something so um, it'll always be on the website do we have any other business that y'all want to bring up with the zoomers that i'm forgetting or missing or whatever no okay um i did a speaker i didn't I'm stick with this i want to stop my share and y'all can come up here and i'm going to introduce ashley gary you want to come fix ashley <laughs> <laughs> i first heard ashley uh, last year i guess not yeah, it hadn't been that long because the baby's only seven and a half months. That's right. So, and she just did a phenomenal job, but she was entertaining and knowledgeable and scared the whole room to death we, we, with snails and slugs. And <laughs> she really knows her stuff. So, and she needs, always needs, she'll tell you, she needs good reporters of things. And, and we are pretty much a, a very observant group of what's going on around us. So. We're, we're a good team for her, a good team fit, I think. So I think you'll get some good information. So, do what? Okay. All right, Ashley. Oh, she's got a lot of cool loot on the back there. Really glad. Okay. Hello. Good evening. Thank you all for having me. As Beth said, I'm Ashley Morgan Olvera. I am the research director for Texas Invasive Species Institute. So at Texas Invasive Species Institute, we focus on early detection and rapid response to newly invasive pests and enhance public education about invasive species. We do that by presenting at various groups. So it can be hobbyist groups, master naturalists, master gardeners. We'll speak to any students of any age. We have outreach events with various entities, conservancies, and we now are also TexasInvasives.org. For a long time, we were sister entities. You might be more familiar with Texas Invasives.org because Texas Invasive Species Institute were housed at Sam Houston State in Huntsville. So now we are a one stop shop for, I'm going to push a button. Okay, we are your non stop shop for invasive species. So whether you go to texasinvasives.org or tsusinvasives.org, if you Google Texas and invasives, you will find us and you will find our information, our database which includes illustrated descriptions, distribution and habitat, biology spread. We provide information on hundreds of different invasive species, plants, insects, animals. If it's invasive, we have it on there. So today I'm just going to go over some invasive pests with you. So to keep things light, tight and bright, but I might also gross y'all out. 
So to start at the beginning, there is, I always like to start with what is the definition? What is an invasive species? Because there can be a lot of misconstrued terms like people think exotic or alien or a weed. Yes, sometimes those terms can overlap, but an invasive species is defined by this, which was created by an executive order in 1999. So if you think about when the definition of of an invasive species came around, you'll understand why it's been such an uphill battle trying to remove some of these species that have been here for hundreds of years. So the federal definition has it as a species that is non-native to the ecosystem under consideration whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. It's red, it's bolded. That is the important part of a definition of the definition that separates an invasive species from an exotic or an ornamental species. It's a species that is not native to the environment under consideration and it is causing harm. Harm can look like many different things as was listed in the definition definition, and it can impact your recreation, your human, our health, in the industry, economy, animal health, agriculture, forestry, na natural heritage. It, an invasive species can cause harm in all of these facets or just one. If it is causing harm, then it is considered an invasive species. So the red imported fire ant is one of those more infamous examples. I know me growing up in Houston, I thought fire ants were Texan. I, I thought they were just here. No, they arrived in potted plants in the 60s. And now they do. They are inhabiting 95% of Texas counties but it is not native and it attacks native ground dwelling animals. So you might know for fire ants do not mess around. They are very aggressive. They will attack anything and that is part of their harm. They harm soil arthropods, their community, they displace native ants. So there's that environmental harm. They also have a significant economic cost. They will eat crops, they will eat animals, they will eat babies, baby animals, eggs, little lizards, you know, they, they have been the cause of decline for many animals. They've been accused of declining the um, Texas horned lizard and, but they have had a significant impact on bobwhite quails because those are ground dwelling animals and their ground nests are necessary for their production. So colonies will destroy numerous crops, soybean, blueberries, cabbage. It says right there, you'll read it, $500 million a year in management. That is not eradication. That is in management efforts, whether it's managing the livestock or the wildlife that have been impaired, public health damages. That's $500 million a year in Texas alone. So that is one invasive species in one state. That's really what started catching everybody's attention is the economic cost. But also this species can threaten our health. If you're allergic to fire ants, you can suffer from anaphylactic shock. So their stings can cause allergic reactions and even death in humans, pets, and livestock. So an invasive species, the main part of the definition is that it causes harm. Now, if an invasive species stayed in one place, well, then we would be able to remove it. Easy peasy eradication. We wouldn't be talking about them today. The problem is they're also much better at spreading, whether it's they produce a thousand more seeds than our native species, or they have three more generations, or they are drought tolerant, or they can tolerate floods, whatever it is, they're able to increase in population size faster than our native species as well. I like to use the lionfish as the example for this one because this is an invasive species that was left unchecked. So if you look at this timeline, it's 1985. So that's 14 years before there's a federal definition on what an invasive species is. So yeah, there are probably research scientists that are talking about it, but it's not something that's being talked about in other realms. So here you have an aquarium in Miami, a hurricane hits, it is flooded. That happens, it's Miami, I'm from Houston dealt through many a hurricane. Not uncommon. So at that point, a pair, a pair of mating lionfish escaped. At that point, what, what could you do? At, and they also thought, well, they're returned to the environment. But also, I mean, they were 
probably washed out miles in the ocean. You can't retrieve them at that point. That mating pair was left alone. And so for the first 12 years, you see that their range doesn't expand too far. It seems to be staying in Southern Florida. So even in 97, people are like, ah, you know, okay, yeah, we've got some lionfish. I don't see the problem. So they kept being unchecked. So what happened was the lionfish has no predators here in the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico. They have paraplytic venom in their spines and they are native to Southeast Asia. And in those waters, in those Pacific waters, there are predators that are adapted for that venom. They will kill them and it balances the ecosystem. So here we have a fish that has no predators and it will eat anything smaller than itself. And they are eating so much here that we did a study looking at parasites of lionfish and we didn't find any parasites. We actually just found out that they had fatty livers and their stomachs were three times the size of lionfish from the Southeast Pacific. So not only are our lionfish having no predators, they're completely gluttonous. So they're going around, they're eating everything. And you can see now they are found from Philadelphia to Venezuela. And unfortunately, since they eat anything smaller than themselves, they have decimated coral reef, coral reef populations because they are eating the fish that maintain those reefs. So not only are they completely disrupting an ecosystem by eating and removing entire, you know, they're eating any fish smaller than them, they're growing, they're completely unchecked. There are also these huge secondary impacts as well, where now we have coral reef dying. And then you'll see that they're off of the coast of Belize. Belize has the second largest coral reef in the world. That's vital. So unfortunately, invasive species, they not only cause harm, they spread really, really quickly. They spread really fast. And normally we, us we can usually think of how things disperse. Maybe a bird carried the seeds. Maybe, you know, it's a wind carried seed or there's sometimes, you know, maybe the adults can fly or run, but we can't always explain how they are moving around. And that's because it's often with human assistance. We are going around and we have been moving things for centuries, if not millennia. We have been importing and exporting goods ever since Marco Polo went to the, went to the Kong, the Khan empire in China. So how invasive species spread? It's all us. It's all humans, whether we're doing it accidentally or purposefully. Accidental is how a lot of invasive plants and insects and pests, have, actually, that's just how a lot of invasive pests have gotten here. Zebra mussels are one of those examples where they were accidentally brought over here because they were hitchhikers in ballast water. Now we look, we scan the ballast water. They, they test for those types of things. But in those moments back in the day, nobody was looking for that. So you've got ship ballasts that have been moving. They pick up water from one port. They travel thousands of miles. They release water. You have packing materials. The emerald ash borer was brought over here because it is a wood boring beetle and Larva were in ash pallets, so pallets made out of ash trees. Things were not, not being scanned for wood boring insects. Spreading firewood or moving firewood is how things have moved around. With once they're in the United States, that's the best way that they've been spreading around is through travelers and then landscaping materials as well. Now there has been purposeful introduction, so the, there's been a. We're, we're kind of trying to correct some mistakes. So back in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of really successful plants and a lot of successful animals. And there was a lot of overfishing of things. And so we, we often thought, well, we overfished. Why don't we just bring in another fish? And that, for, that should be fine. Or we're having an erosion problem. Why don't we plant this giant reed because it's so great at stopping erosion when no, it's not. And then you have the King Ranch blue stem that was planted across the entire state because it, it was known to also be good for erosion control. So it's one of those, we've been doing things purposefully 
And we're trying to correct those things. But you can still buy a lot of pets and plants purposefully. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Or actually, right now. So that's what I'm saying. Invasive does not always mean illegal. It's not a guarantee. So unfortunately, when you go to our websites, you'll see hundreds of species on there. And you'll email me and you might say, Ashley, I can't believe it. I have somebody rearing nutria next to me or something, something invasive. And you're like, I want to hold them accountable. And unfortunately, if they're not prohibited, we cannot hold them accountable. So even though there is a definition, hundreds of invasive species, especially plants, are sold. There are major contradictions in landscaping and pet industries. While I just told you how lionfish are terrible, you can go and buy a lionfish tonight if you wanted to. It's not a prohibited species in our state, and some are not even prohibited federally. So you will see a lot of contradictions. However, there are some. There are some that are illegal. You cannot have. And they are listed on different. So each state has their own lists. The Texas Department of Agriculture runs the noxious and invasive plant list. So if you do noxious and invasive plant list Texas, it will bring you to this page. You click where that red circle is, the TDA's noxious and invasive plant regulations. Then you click on an image. It will show you a list. This is the list. I just told you there's hundreds of invasive plants. This is the list of prohibited species. However, if you see a nursery selling any of these, send me an email. I will get in contact with the TDA. Fines will be issued. They should not be selling any of these species. However, it's a short list, but there still can be some accountability for some of these. There is also, T Texas Parks and Wildlife also has a prohibited fish, shellfish, and aquatic plants list. This is where you can also report aquariums selling any of these species. You would do that via aquatic invasives at tpwd.texas.gov. So the lists over there, I like to highlight, oh, I can use the cursor, texasinvasives.org. So our website is there as well. You can click on their quick reference guide or they have the sections listed there below, fish, shellfish, and aquatic plants. There are a lot more fish, shellfish, and aquatic plants that are prohibited than there are just plants. So please review that list, but also I'll talk about how that ties into an initiative we have. So there's a lot of action going on. We've got some regulations now. We're learning from our lessons. We're learning how are these species getting here? How are they spreading? How can we stop those pathways? So we're detecting, we're monitoring. Those are the things that we are working on at institutes like ours. However, there's also a lot of public awareness going on. I know a lot of y'all have seen these, especially being so close to Austin, you're going to see all of the TPWD campaigning. But this is why it's out there, because we need people to wonder what is an invasive species, because if they know what it is, then they might actually know how they contribute to their spread accidentally. So us doing the research and the monitoring and trying to manage what we can on our end and learn about their biology is only half of the picture. The other half is having engaged citizens like yourselves do what they can to either report invasive species, remove inv invasive species from their area, or just change their habits to make sure that they're not helping them spread around. So take action. What can you do? You can keep informed with our monthly newsletter at iWire. It's our iWire, so you go to texasinvasives.org and you just click on that logo up in the corner. If you provide your email, that is all you will receive from us is a monthly email about invasive species. It will highlight citizen scientist groups that are doing removals in Texas. It'll highlight any news that's going on in the United States, and it will present our workshop schedules as well. So if you just want to keep informed, you can always sign up for our monthly iWire. But really, you need to prevent dispersal. 
do not give them a free ride. Please don't. So we have to detect early and then we need to watch what our movements are doing. So we aid in their transport. They're here because of us, because we like to move things. So that's why we have initiatives like don'tmovefirewood.org is a great resource that you can always share. And that's something to keep in mind, even on a local level. I did a presentation a few months ago, and someone had mentioned that they took firewood, their neighbor's tree had died, they chopped down the tree, and so they took the wood and they used it for firewood. Unfortunately, they didn't realize that that neighbor's tree had died from bark beetles, and they brought that wood over to theirs, and now their tree is also suffering from those bark beetles. It does not have to be an invasive species to harm your tree. There are hundreds of native bark beetles out there, and normally they only attack when trees are drought stricken, which in this area, trees can often get drought stricken. So it's just something to be really wary of, be vigilant and look for them whenever you can. And that is what Beth kind of talked on is we need your help, helping reporting, helping looking for these invasive species. I am one set of eyes. And now just talking to y'all, I don't know how many people are online, but I have a lot more than one set of eyes. So having y'all informed and looking out there and reporting to us really helps us be able to respond to things in real time. Because with invasive species, if we're not there at the very beginning, it's a very long road. So we have a reporting system that focuses on the Sentinel Pest Network. And this is a network that focuses on lists from APHIS PPQ. That's a lot of acronyms to say that is the invasive species branch of the USDA. I do a lot of work with them. It's great stuff. So they, we coordinated with them to create a list of the big bads. So the invasive species that we know will cause a lot of problems. So that is our Sentinel Pest Network. It original, oh. So our Sentinel Pest Network, species and how to report. I had touched on our websites before that these are always really good identification resources, but I strongly encourage you to download our reporting app and also go to the Quiet Invasion. This is run by the Galveston Bay upper Texas coast watershed. So you might think, Ashley, we are in central Texas or somewhere else. If you're online, we are nowhere near the Galveston Bay. I promise you this resource, there's a lot of plants and insects and pests that are found statewide. This is a great resource as well. So between all of these resources, there's also plenty of federal ones out there as well. But if you can't remember something I said, you can always go to one of our websites and look more into it. So the Sentinel Pest Network started off as a dirty dozen. It was a list of species, again, that we knew would cause a lot of problems. And so some more infamous names are on there that you see. We have the Emerald Ash Borer, you've got the giant African land snail, cactus moth, kogon grass, giant hogweed, onion weed. So it was a mixed list of insects and plants. The list has doubled since then. And I am by no means going to talk about everything. I know that we don't have that much time, but right here, currently in Texas, is what I want you to look at in this column. Well, so while the list has doubled, there is a significant portion of them that are here in Texas. So we do need you to help us look for them. Even though they are here, we need to track how quickly they're spreading, especially if it could be a significant distribution jump. We want to know how or when it's happened, and then we can look into how it's happened. So the Sentinel Pest Network, to report these species, you just go to our website or you just go into the phone app. This is how easy we want to, want to make it very accessible. It's right there on our homepage. You go to texasinvasives.org, this is how it looks. You can scroll left or right to pick on the species, or you can go to the Take Action tab right up here, click report it, and you have a long list for you to look at as well. It does not require a login. So some people that are familiar with Texas Invasives might remember we do have a citizen scientist reporting program that requires a login and all of that. No, this one, we want to hear about this from anybody. So this list is up there all the time and anybody can report about it. So the first one I'll start with our more infamous one is the Emerald Ash Borer which I just remembered. I have 
half of this place. So the emerald ash borer is native to Asia. And as I had mentioned earlier on, it hitchhiked here in shipping pallets. So whether it was wood chip, whether it was wood chips or shipping pallets, it was brought here because of the movement of goods. So this is, it's hard to see. That's the larva. Don't worry, we'll have pictures later, but I want y'all to get a size reference here too. This is an adult. That is my pink. I'm not a giant. <laughs> so that is that is not a very big. And then this is what the bark can look like underneath the also. <laughs> so the emerald ash borer, it was brought here because of moving shipping products. So it was first introduced into Michigan. This map is the current distribution of it. So all of the counties that are yellow in all of those states is where the emerald ash borer is now. Its host tree is any ash species, any ash species. If it starts with Fraxinus, it can be attacked. It does not care if it is a young tree, a healthy tree, an old tree, a drought stricken tree. It does not care. It will invade the tree. It will destroy it. So I've done uh, quite a few trips um, in the Wisconsin area. And it's really, really sad when you drive through Missouri, through Kansas. If you are driving in the summertime and you see a lot of dead trees, those are ashes. They're not coming back, they're gone. So this beetle can destroy an entire genus of trees and it is now here in Texas. It's been here for seven years now. The most recent expansion was it going from Cass. So it went from the Texarkana, Texarkana area and it jumped over to Fort Worth. Now it's found in Dallas County. That's not much of a surprise. Tarrant and Dallas are right next to each other, but that's not good for I'm from Houston, so I'm off of the I-45 corridor, and y'all are off of near the I-35 corridor, so that's not a good thing either, is if these bugs are moving around, they can easily be spread. So I was showing y'all, so that's the larval stage right here. The emerald ash borer gets its name because it is a green beetle that lives in ash trees. It bores into ash trees. So the life cycle starts with adults emerging from a tree. These adults can fly for miles. So us giving, they can spread themselves. So unfortunately with them making it here to the United States and then us moving firewood for decades with not quite processing what was going on, we've given them a free ride for quite a while. So the adults will lay eggs on the tree bark. The eggs will hatch into these larvae. The larvae will burrow into the tree and they will go through the xylem and the phloem. And that's how they kill the trees as they stop the circulatory system. They will pupate in the wood. So this is often the form that was in the wood pallets was the pupa is and so then they would pupate and emerge as an adult the adult leaves the tree and the life cycle continues so for an emerald ash borer it is a small beetle so you want to look at certain characteristics in your ash tree is it experiencing canopy dieback so is it dying from the top down are there epicormic shoots? So that would suggest that there is stress happening if the tree is trying to start regrowing. So are there epicormic shoots? So little regrowth with oversized leaves, D-shaped exit holes. That picture makes them look very big. They are not very big. See that? They are not big holes. These are dainty beetles. Get an idea. So they are not ginormous D-shaped holes, but they are D-shaped holes, and that's because the adults have a flat back. So when they come out, it's the shape of a D. Are you seeing the bark split? And you're seeing those beetle galleries underneath. If you are, if you have any of these symptoms and you can confirm the presence of beetles, you need to immediately remove the tree. You need to mulch it and finely mulch it. And that is to destroy any part of the beetle. So you don't want to do like a two inch size mulch. You would want to do something like a quarter inch, something really fine 
to make sure that you're mulching it. I know in this area, it's not easy to burn. If you're ever out of a burn ban, I suggest burning it. Again, mulching might be your best management. You can mulch it, lay it out on plastic. You could even add a little pesticide on it for added measure, but really the mulching is going to help. You just don't want to let the tree stay. You don't want to chop it into firewood and you don't want to share that firewood with your friends. So how do you identify the emerald ash borer? It is a green metallic beetle. So it is a, quite a pretty beetle. What really will help you separate it from native species is that under those green wings, it is red or purple underneath. So it's almost like a Christmas beetle. Bright red, bright green wings, and then on the underside is red or purple. That is what's going to help you tell the difference because there are native agrillus species here. But what I tried to highlight, if you look at the information, remember it's a matter of what tree are you seeing a green beetle on. So these other native species none of their host trees are ash trees. So if you are seeing your ash tree is not looking so great, it's got some holes in it, there's a green beetle, then we definitely have it. Please report it to us. And then, I mean, try to get a sample, but promptly destroy your tree. But actually, definitely get a sample because that would be a really large distribution jump if it went from Dallas to Williamson County or Tarrant to Williamson. So the next one is the spotted lantern fly. This one I won't ask. I'm sure. There's no way to it, right? I was like, I'm sure they can see it. I was like, there's no way. But even y'all can, I'll show it to y'all later. It's just, it's fragile. I don't have a lid on it, but this is a big bug. Y'all can, I know you can see it at the back of the room. It's a big bug. So this is the spotted lantern fly. I always appreciate a big bug because it's easy to see. So the spotted lantern fly is, I always like this story. It's from Mexico. It was brought here um, through shipping goods. And it, ironically, it was in, hidden in imported goods from Asia. So it wasn't even in imported goods from Mexico, but imported goods from Asia. But when I tell you about some of the host plants, it might make sense. So imported goods from Asia, and it first was detected in Pennsylvania in 2014. After that, it established in Connecticut, Delaware, Massachusetts, Maryland. So pretty much the Northeast, not, not all the way up into New England, but it's up in the Northeast. Unfortunately, it is expanding. And... It can fly. It is a flying insect. So we can not stop it if it gets out of hand. So it has now expanded into Indiana, Michigan, North Carolina, and Ohio. You might be thinking, Ashley, I mean, that's still pretty far away. I mean, I know we got to stay vigilant, but but what is the threat to us? What What is the threat? The threat is that the spotted lanternfly is known to have over 70 host plants. Some of those host plants, they have a nice symbiotic relationship. A lot of those host plants, they do not have a symbiotic relationship. They will destroy the crops, uh, mainly stone fruits and those types of trees are a big concern for the Northeast, but for us, it's really, it's, yes, some peach stone fruits, but the common grapevine is one of their favorite host plants. And since we have a large sprawling vineyard and industry, that's something that we should, we need to protect. So the spotted lanternfly is a great concern for Texas because of the threat that it poses to our orchard and vineyard industries. So the problem is that the spotted lanternfly has so many host plants, it can catch a ride. It can survive off of these different host plants as it moves along. And unfortunately, one of it, the host plants is the tree of heaven. This is an ornamental plant that has turned invasive. The green on this map is where the tree of heaven is in Texas. You will see that that directly overlaps with wine production, all the way from the east to the west coast, or not coast, east to west side of Texas. I mean, from Orange to El Paso and up into the Panhandle, the tree of heaven is present. So it's easily identifiable. Oh, it's not to the tree yet. So thankfully, the insect is easily identifiable. 
it's a big buck. So helpful that it's big. And then also I like to call this a watermelon insect. It looks like it has eyes on the back, but the four wings are nice and spotted. And those back wings look like watermelon eyes. So you've got the bright red with the spots and the white and the black. We do not have, and this is a true bug. So this is a hemipteran. We do not have any true bug that looks like this. We do not have any insect here that looks like this. So it's easily identifiable. It's an inch big and it's got bright coloration on it. The immatures are even very interesting to look at too. They're black and white and the older that they get, they start getting some more red coloration in preparation for them having all of the red and black spots on their adult forms. So the tree of heaven, see part of the tie-in? It's native to China. Right. I, I have a feeling that's why the spotted lanternfly was over in China having a really good time. And that's how it got over here instead of through Mexico. So it's it was very popular in the ornamental trade and it was started even in the 1700s. So it's now found in 42 states. It's known to have a very toxic effect on its environment. So much like Chinese tallow and a lot of other invasive plants, it has the allelopathic effects. It will change the soil to its benefit so that more tree of heaven can grow to the demise of everything else. They also are have an aggressive root system that will uproot foundations and they will cause damage to sewers. They have long large leaves. So they're one to four feet long. Their leaves are large and compound. They'll have 11 to 25 leaflets that alternate along the stems. They flower late spring. So the flowers are not necessarily so obvious. That's that picture in that left-hand corner. It's more the the Samaras, they're seeds. So they're those papery seeds. So kind of like an ash, sheet, ash seed, but they have that it, it's beautiful. I can see why it's an ornamental plant. It's a beautiful pink and orange coloration on that seed. So do you have a tree with those seeds? Please remove it from your yard. The next pest that I want to talk to you about is the brown marmorated stink bug. This is a pentatomid, so it's a, a shield bug, and it's native to Asia. And this was first detected in Pennsylvania. This map shows states where it has been detected, where it's a nuisance, agricultural, or severe agriculture. So green is where it's present. So the brown marmated stink bug is present here in Texas. Currently, it is not causing agriculture or nuisance problems, but that doesn't mean we should take our eye off the ball. So it has been found in Collin, Dallas, Fort Bend, Harris, and Montgomery counties. So kind of sporadic near the Houston area, near the Dallas area. The problem is that it has even more host plants. It can, it, it can survive off of 300 different kinds of crops and ornamentals. I am by no means going to go into that list but it's bad. So the adults and the instars, it's much like any other true bug, any other pentatomid. It does go through many molts. I like the very first instars. They look like little pumpkin, little jack-o'-lantern bugs. They're just, those I feel like are more identifiable than the large adult itself. The large adult looks kind of like your generic stink bug. So it's a shield shaped body. What helps you identify and I'll point it, because I realize I'm going to point it right here. Fourth antennal segment. So there is a white band on the fourth antennal segment that is not present on other insects that you will commonly see. It also has the barred black and white. So right here, you've got the black and white striping that's coming out there. Otherwise, the rest of it is kind of mottled and brown, and so it might be kind of hard to tell the difference. There is, I mean, here is your brown stink bug, right? How do you tell the difference between these two? So they kind of look the same, but we don't have the, dis so this one is our native species. Yes, it has the same pattern. It is not a distinct black and white pattern. Yes, it has the antennae, but it does not have that white band at the very end of its antenna. So yeah, it may seem like 
minor details, but those are things that can be observed in the field. And we definitely want you to try to take pictures of those traits when you're submitting reports to us so that we can make confirmations. It's also important to note that it has smooth shoulders. So there's other stink bugs out there that have kind of spines on their shoulders. So the brown marmated stink bug has that fourth antennal segment, has the black and white on its butt, and it has smooth shoulders as well. The next pest, is the hammerhead yeah. So y'all, so this is the hammerhead flatworm. I had them in my yard. I reported them, I blood-tricked them. I never, yes, yes. yes. talked. <laughs> I remember blowtorch. They are very susceptible to fire. They are they are squishy body things. So hammerhead flatworms, as y'all heard one of your members, yes, they are here. They are very prevalent. They are all throughout. Historically speaking, we we as an institute, we knew them to kind of be in the Houston area. And that was more from anecdotes of, oh yeah, I grew up with them in the Beaumont area. And so Kind of, we knew them to be around in Texas since the 1980s, and we thought them to be more in an, an East Texas problem. But then once we started doing a call for reports with citizens, we realized, no, they're all throughout the Dallas area, all throughout Austin, San Antonio, down to the Rio Grande Valley. So they're pretty much anywhere that there is humidity, anywhere that there will be earthworms. So that's why we, this is how this species causes harm. It's a predator of earthworms. So you might be concerned. You might hear when you look this up, you might hear something about a neurotoxin and that, you know, it, it can cause harm to you. But it's important to remember, yes, it does secrete a neurotoxin, but that's to kill earthworms. So it does not cause us harm. I've had thousands of people report to me about hammerhead flatworms. I've only had two people that actually had an allergic reaction was all they had. They just had to put some calamine on it and, and call it a day. So you can handle these, but if you're handling them, I want you to be putting them in a Ziploc bag with salt and throwing them away or any container with salt. Don't just throw them in the trash can. They can crawl out. They will get out. They will squeeze into weird places and appear in your shower. So you need to make sure you are sealing them away. And that goes for a lot of these invertebrates that I'm about to talk about is it's just important not to cut them up. They will regenerate from segments. So be sure if you're throwing to throw them away. And it's also important to note that these are commonly found when you've just, maybe your neighbor brought in some mulch, maybe you brought in a new tree, maybe it just rained a lot. And apparently the new yard from like five blocks finally washed out, whatever it is, but it often, they appear when you're bringing in new materials into your yard. So definitely keep an eye out for them. There's nothing native that Correct. There is nothing native. And that's a great question. I always appreciate that. I like it when things are very obvious. You cannot make a mistake because, you know, it's, it's a bad feeling. You're like, wait, did I do the right thing or not? So, no, there is nothing else that looks like this. If it is a worm with a hammerhead, it looks like a hammerhead shark and a worm made a baby. And if it looks like that, then please dispose of it. So the Asian jumping worm, this is one that's becoming a, a pretty big concern. It's here, it's appearing in Texas. We've gotten reports in North Texas. So the Asian jumping worm, I will go into how to tell the difference between that and naturalized earthworms. I do just have to make a quick PSA. It is important to note that no earthworms of any kind are native to the United States. So you have to keep things localized. However, if you have an Asian jumping worm, Low torch it. So other nicknames, and this is important to note, especially if you're an angler, other nicknames, snake worm, crazy worm, Alabama jumper. I just had somebody call me the other day and they asked, can I grow these night crawlers? Yes, you can. Can I rear Alabama jumpers? I said, no, you may not. And I told him why, which was all the harm that they cause. So but like many other invasive invertebrates, it hitched, hiked in potted plants. It's been here 
for 110 years already. It's now starting to migrate southwards. So it has been causing problems in the Great Lakes areas for a long time. So there's a lot of great resources out there from the University of Minnesota and Wisconsin that talk about these species. And they have a lot of webinars available to the public as well. So why are they worse than European earthworms? So our, what we consider an earthworm, you usually use it in your compost or you keep it in your garden because they are nutrient cyclers, right? Like that's the term that you always use. An earthworm is a nutrient cyclers. Asian jumping worms are not. They are nutrient removers. They are nutrient depleters. They remove nutrients so much, they change the composition of soil. They remove all the moisture, all the nutrients, so that plants are completely eroded. Grass topsoil is gone. And they reach maturity twice as fast. So not only do they completely change and destroy <laughs> the soil that they're in, they also grow faster than our naturalized earthworms. So they will consume the upper, mat upper matter, the organic matter in the upper layers. That's what I'm trying to say. They consume that organic matter. So what this can help you show is they change the composition. It looks like coffee ground soil. So it looks like coffee grounds. It's dry, it's grainy. It, it, it's not the same consistency that you're used to. And that's because the soil has been left without the ability to hold moisture or deliver nutrients to plants. They loosen it so much that the roots end up uprooting and that the plants end up dying because they are not getting the nutrients that they need as well. So they, their digestion changes the appearance of soil. So you want to look for a change in soil and then also a behavior. So there's a behavioral difference that you can look at and a physical difference. So there is a physical difference between the invasive jumping worm and a European earthworm. So the, the physical difference is where it gets its nickname. It's called jumping worm because it, it'll it thrash around. I mean, it'll do this. It's like an angry snake. Usually when you disturb an earthworm, they're kind of, uh... no, this one will thrash around like an angry snake. So if you see a worm and you disturb it, and then it's suddenly responding, not like an earthworm should at all. There's your first sign. Your second sign is the bands around their bodies. They're called clitellums. Jumping worms have light clitellums. So that collar around them is light and it is flush with the body and it fully surrounds the body as well. So the picture down there at the bottom really shows the clitellum very well. I like this picture at the top left. That is both species right there. So you've got that or both. That's complicated. That's both kinds of worms up there. So you've got the Amanthus jumping worm on the left and the Lumbricus earthworm underneath. So the clitellum on the earthworm, you'll see it's raised. It's not flush with the body. It's raised and it's pink. It'll have a darker color to it than the collar would on a jumping worm. Also, their bodies, so not only do the jumping worms thrash around, they're not slimy either. They're slick, again, like a snake. They pretty much, if you find a worm that is not acting like an earthworm at all, please take a picture, report it to us, and immediately destroy it. Next one, next one of our wonderful invertebrates. These ones, these are well. Really easy to identify. These are all over some of our first, outside of Orange, Texas, some of our greater expansion, uh, it, Austin areas hit pretty hard. So all the way up through Williamson County as well. So this is the black velvet leather leaf slug. As the name, it's a long name, but the name reflects on what it is. It is a black slug and it's velvet. So what that means is it's matte. It's not slimy. It's not slimy and mucusy. Yes, it has a slime trail, it's a slug, but it's matte in appearance. And so we do not have any native slug that is black. We do not have native black slugs. So this, if you see this in your yard, you need to promptly remove it. And it's not 
really from the fact that yes, it can harm St. Augustine grass. It's more from the reason that it's known to carry parasites. And if we involve ourselves in that life cycle, we can get infected with those parasites. Now I know that's where I start freaking people out. So the only way we get these parasites is if we eat them. So the parasite is called Angiostrongylus cantonensis. So in the Canton region of China, where it's common to consume raw or undercooked snails, that is how this parasite would happen in the Canton region of China. Here in the United States, we do not eat raw or undercooked snails, even though it, it, it could be a good source of protein. I don't recommend it. We don't do that. So we're not eating slugs. But the thing is, if we are handling the slugs and the slime trail gets on us, see, we have to digest the parasites. So if you're handling the slug and the parasites are in the slime and you touch your mouth, you're ingesting it. If you have a slug crawling all over your garden, vegetables and you don't wash them before you're ingesting the parasite right now please note not every slug has the parasite just because you see it or just because you touch it does not mean you will be infected but the parasite is here in texas it is here in the i mean it's been we have it in reports in the houston area and the san antonio area so it's real it does exist so you want to remove this species and we do recommend not using your hands, but if you do, just wash them before touching your mouth, please, please. COVID rules apply. You touch something gross, just don't put your hands in your mouth. So this is something really to point out to your children and your grandchildren. Hey, those slugs are cool, but let's let's leave the slugs alone, right? Like, tell me if you see a slug and then you'll remove them from them. So don't keep them as pets and just wash your gardens, fruits and veggies. Just a simple wash with water or if you want to use a vegetable wash, you can. But just washing, it's very preventable, but it's important that you know it exists and it's important that you remove invasive mollusks from your yard because there are several species out there that are here in Texas that will transmit that parasite to you. We've got the black velvet leatherleaf slug, the giant garden slug, the yellow garden slug, the marsh slug, the new guinea flatworm, and the apple snail. All more information about these species can be found at our website. But if you see any of these, please remove them from your yard and wash your hands because they can transmit them. So managing invasive species, if it were easy, we wouldn't be here. Thank you. Thank you for the chuckles. So really, the as I was trying to point out, prevention is, is the strongest thing that you can do. Just being aware of what you're doing. So like with jumping worms, if you notice, you know, something in your yard, then you don't want to share plants with your neighbor because you could be then spreading them to them, right? So it's remove early and often. And that is whether it is an invasive pest or plant, because you have probably had a whole bunch more hammerhead flatworms in your yard. It's kind of once there's one, there's going to be more. So you just have to stay vigilant, stay on top of it. Be, and we often suggest an integrated approach, especially with invasive plants. You can't just cut them down and wish them away. Because again, if it was easy, I, I wouldn't have a job. So we really want you to just be aware of what your surroundings, what you're doing. If you're using chemicals to manage, monitor, repeat, and plant natives, which it's easy to do because you all get free native plants here and you have got plant sales coming up. So it's really easy to manage that. Just remember the rehabilitation phase is the most important. If you are removing a lot of things from your yard, you have to replace it. Otherwise, those invasive species have seed banks that last a whole lot longer than native species. So they'll just come back. This is all I talked to you about today. That's a lot, right? That was a lot. See, I didn't even list the other ones. It was just slugs. Slugs, snails, don't do it. So how do you report? I know I briefly touched on the website, but it's you just send a picture to us through the form. So what I, I really encourage for you is just to Remember right now as our website stands, or you don't know. So as our website stands, you can submit one picture. 
So please make sure that it is a clear picture and that it is focusing on the traits that you want me to identify, right? So if you're trying to report the brown mermaid stink bug, just make sure at least the insect is in focus so I can confirm it. A contrasting background is always really helpful. I mean, this is a gorgeous photo. I don't expect this quality. He is an insect photographer, so I don't expect that quality, but this is hard for me to identify. I'm pretty sure it was a china berry. I'm pretty sure that's what they're trying to report. But but what about the vine? I mean, I, that might be a Mustang grape. I don't know. I don't know. I need some help. So, you know, just provide a little contrast behind if you can. And if you can provide pictures of the characteristics. So here I see the leaves. I can see if they're alternate or if they're opposite and I can see the berries and the coloration, all of that kind of stuff helps me identify. Or if I share it with another expert, we need to have enough idea of what we're looking at because we're trying to confirm with confidence of what we're seeing. So just providing something in focus is in focus is the main is the main key. So if you are so interested that you you are willing to report to us, please do. You just go to our website. Remember, it doesn't require a login. You can go to take action and click report it. If you click on that, it will pull up a form. This form, it really is just asking for your name, email, phone number, address, and a location of where you found it. If you're not comfortable with giving us all of that information, I need at least the location of where it is at and an email to contact you at because I need to let you know if yes or no, that this was it. But please be mindful, that information stays in house. The only thing that we ever share is the location of the invasive species, because we need to share that with our federal reports as well, because they're tracking our website. Like they wanna know what we're gathering as well, because we're everybody's looking for them. So we do have a phone app that you can look at to report species or look even for just our Invasives database. So it's got two different names, iPhone, it's Texas Invaders, Android, it's Texas Invasives. And you can always email us at invasives at shsu.edu. So say there's a species that isn't on the reported, we're working on adding some of them, especially the jumping worm, we're working on adding that to be one of our sentinel pests because we are greatly concerned about that. But for the time being, you can always email us at invasives at SHSU. And you can always keep, keep informed with the iWire under that take action tab. See if you're already under the take action tab to report it. You can just click on keep informed and sign up for our iWire. So tying into the prohibited fish and shellfish list, we have an initiative right now that we do need your help with. It's called an Aquarium Watch. We right now have funding with Parks and Wildlife where we're trying to look at different aquaria. Some of it is just marketability. Some of it's just to see, yes, we know this species is invasive, but how widespread is it? So like the pleco fish right there, the sucker fish, those are not prohibited, but they are really invasive. So we just want to see how widespread are they sold. So if you're interested, if you like going to aquarium stores and sending emails to people like me, then this is for you. You would just need to go into an aquarium, see if they're selling any of these species. If they are, you take a picture of it. You could ask the shop owner, how long have you been selling this species? And that's it. And they tell you, and that's it. Then you email me and I handle everything else with parks and wildlife because some of these species are prohibited, so they shouldn't be selling them. So please, if you're interested, you can just send an email to invasives at shsu.edu for more information. Or you can contact me at my personal email, which is arm001. And with that, I can take questions. Yes. Uh, so you have the reporting tool there for the Texas invasives. Do, do you all monitor iNaturalist as well? No, we don't monitor iNaturalist. I mean, we do look for it for other reports to fill in some gaps and stuff, but we need to be with the scientific, like the higher verification level is where we would take the data from, you know, the upper validation or whatever. Yeah. So um, we do look at that to kind of see if, if there's any 
gaps that are being filled in on iNaturalist as well. Yeah. And we want to, we're working on updating our website. We would like ours to at least feed into iNaturalist. It'd be nice, you know, it'd be nice if they fed our way, but that's where some of that data is a little messy. We don't want that. But we want to start feeding our data into iNaturalist. It's just the Texas Invasives website is antiquated and it doesn't quite do that kind of thing, but we're working on it. <laughs> Any other questions in the room? Okay. We have some on Zoom. Um, some states are starting to prohibit brand repairs. Texas considering this? I haven't heard anything. And it's definitely not on the prohibited list. And they haven't added anything to that list in a long time. And I kind of think they should get Ligustrum on there before Bradford Pair. Yeah. <laughs> um, this was about the, from the part about the Emerald Ash Borer. There was a, is it a Gorilla's Macer? Maybe the host was Hackberries? Yes. So normally our native species, they, they like to keep their home. They don't like to burn it down like these invasive ones. So usually it's okay. If you don't notice any dieback on your hackberry, it's usually okay. But if your hackberry has been maybe a little drought stricken, but look for those same symptoms in your hackberry. Is it having the canopy dieback? Then yeah, the balance has, has gone in favor of the beetle. And uh, what should you do with firewood whose origin you don't know? Trash it? Uh, burn it right now? <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Ooh. Uh, oh. <laughs> How'd you get firewood? You didn't know where it came from. Nah, I, I could see that happening. I could see my. You can buy them cheap here. Well, to that's buy true. Them. That's true. Yeah. So. That's true. Um, I guess I would say if you don't know the origin, kind of scan it over maybe for beetles. Just kind of keep an eye on it. Look on, look at it <laughs> as best you can. <laughs> so yeah, now I get like some unknown origin, but that happens actually quite often. So yeah, I would say just keep an eye on it for beetles. I would maybe bag, if you're not going to use it for a while, you could try doing some sort of sunning where you're, you know, you're wrapping it in plastic, but that create, but doing something to try to kill anything that is inside before you burn it would be good. Um, and then on the, is it spotted lanternfly? Yes. And you said it was a problem with the grapes, our native grapes around here. Uh, yes. What that? Like it, it could be, yes, our, our native like Mustang grapes, your common grape vines. Yes, those can be host plants for the spotted lantern fly. Malta star thistle has invaded a green belt in this person's area. How is it introduced and how best to eradicate it? Um, so that that's one of those that it's best to eradicate it. Don't mow it when it is flowering. Um, I would say wait till it's done flowering and then try to dig up whatever you can. And you're probably going to have to come back and do it again and again. And depending on what, because it depends on what surrounding vegetation is there on if you can, it sounds like if it's a green belt, you can't really go around spraying a bunch of herbicide because you don't want to impact the other stuff around it. So it'd be trying to do a more focused approach. If they're large thistles, you could cut them and paint the stump with herbicide to focus it. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't recommend doing a lot of mowing or trying to manage them when they're flowering because that's how they'll spread quicker. But they've got wind carrying seeds. They're, they're spread like, they already got over here. So they spread like many other plants do, just wind dispersed seeds and animals. Okay, that's the only questions on the uh, Zoom. All right. Okay, well, thank you all for having me. Thank you.